Uh, I am Mark Bastian. This is my first Closure Con. I'm really glad to be here. It's been a great conference. Um, today I'm going to talk about uh, bottom up versus top down design and closure. And in the time since I submitted the abstract and prepared the slides and got until now, that title has kind of morphed a little bit uh, to API first versus data first design and closure. And really they're uh, related topics. Um, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm a mechanical engineer by training, but I have been doing software development my entire uh, professional life. Um, I programmed in a lot of different languages and a lot of different interesting projects. Um, uh, a long time ago, I've done you know, languages like Pascal, Visual Basic, Fortran. In terms of languages that I have spent uh, significant portions of my career doing software development in, I've spent uh, you know, at least four years doing C++, over a decade in Java, uh, over six years in Scala, and in the last couple of years, I have been, uh, had the good fortune of being able to do uh, closure both personally and professionally. And uh, throughout these different experiences, I've, I've uh, had the opportunities to learn both the you know, object-oriented programming as well as functional programming techniques. I think one of the big barriers to entry when people start learning closure or FP in general is just the way we think is it's a little bit different, um, often from what is taught in the school. And so that's part of uh, what I want to talk about today is one of, the, one of those different ways of thinking. Before I jump into top-down versus bottom-up design, I want to talk about a specific problem that I'll be modeling as part of this talk, and that is uh, game design, specifically tabletop game design. Um, I'm going to look at a specific game. Uh, this game is called Cartagena. It's not a, uh, probably a really common game. In fact, has anybody here played Cartagena? All right, we got a couple hardcore gamers. Good job. So uh, um, there are a few. Um, but probably everybody here has played a board game in their life, and so you're familiar with games and how games work. And that's one reason why I chose this as a topic, is whatever your background is, um, you probably have some familiarity with the idea. And uh, games, really, when you think about them, have some application to real life, uh, to many of the systems we work in, the do domains we work in. Uh, games all have nouns. They have things that we interact with and model. This particular game has a board. A lot of games have boards. Um, and it's randomly generated. It has cards that are in a deck. Uh, it has little pieces, little pirate pieces. Uh, the goal is you're a bunch of pirates trying to escape from a prison. And then it has a boat at the end that you're trying to work your way towards. Uh, games also uh, have verbs. They have actions. And so there are the things, you know, the things, the previous slide was the things that you have. And now these are the things that you want to do. And any system also is going to have uh, things that you're going to do to it. Um, for this particular game, uh, the actions that you have are when the game starts, everybody is given six random cards and, and just you know, for your information as far as the basics of the game, each card has one of six symbols which correspond to the symbols on the game track. And on your turn, you get three actions and you get to choose from the following uh, items to, to do for your actions. You can either play a card and you can pick any of your pirates and move it forward to the next open space that has that symbol on it. Uh, and if there are none, then you get to move to the boat. Um, or you can move a pirate backwards, and that's how you earn cards. Um, and so to move backwards, the first space behind you that has one or two pirates on it, you get one or two cards. And so there's kind of this, kind of this uh, load balancing game where you're trying to move forward. At the same time, you have to move back to gain more cards so you can move forward. Um, your third action is you can just pass and, and uh, end your turn early. Um, and then the first player to move all their pirates to the boat wins. So uh, back to my first question, well, how would you design a game in general, this particular game. So let's talk about a couple of approaches. The first approach, which if you're uh, from a very strong object-oriented programming background, this probably is very familiar, and that's top-down or API first design. For that approach, what you're trying to do fundamentally is answer two questions. You want to know what are the components in my system and the relationships, and as well as have I sufficiently broken down that system so that I understand it. So I have some top-level uh, idea or concept. In this case, it's game or a specific game. What are the pieces underneath it? Um, do I fully understand? Is each of those tractable from a programming standpoint? If not, then I need to break it down. And that's how I answer that, that second question. And so there's a, you know, just a real simple flow diagram way you can visualize this. So you can start with a high level problem description, game. Um, for each class in your module or in your, in your system, you would break that down. And again, this applies to anything in which you're trying to do a, a functional or object-wise decomposition. And you say, well, I do I need to further refine that? Uh, if the answer is yes, then you go through and you refine all your objects and then until you're done. And then when you're done, you have your class hierarchy. And that's the, kind of the basic way we do things, whether we're doing this explicitly or implicitly when we sit down and say, I'm going to you know, model something in Java, you know, you're going to start writing classes and in your head, you're going to be uh, probably breaking things down this way. Um, 
when you're done doing that, there's going to be some level of refinement. Um, you're probably going to be looking for abstractions and patterns and ways that you can uh, make base classes to make your code reusable. Um, and then once you're done doing that, you're going to be doing some specific implementations of those classes. So let's walk through an example of how you might do that with just the concept of games rather than this, a specific game. Um, so you could start with the abstraction of game. Just say, I've got a game interface. And you could give that to somebody, and while that is a complete API for all games, um, it's not particularly useful. And so you say, well, is this simple enough? No, it is not. So I need to break that down. And so how would we decompose this? Well, you could go look at what a definition of a game is. Uh, games are systems in which players engage in artificial conflict defined by rules that result in a quantifiable outcome. So I could look at that and say, all right, I'm going to uh, uh, further break games down into this idea of a game, and games have players, and games have rules. And that still isn't particularly useful. Um, all games do have players, rules, how you define that, that's very abstract. Um, so you might want some more utility functions or classes, helper classes, uh, break it down even more concretely. So again, looking at games, there are a lot of different types of games. Uh, there are uh, board games, card games, video games, sports games. Um, we're gonna focus on, again, tabletop type games. So uh, board games, um, are one type of game, and they often have tokens or pieces. Uh, they often have dice for resolving movement or conflict or other elements of the game to introduce randomness. Uh, card games usually come in a deck, so that's one way that we could uh, break our uh, class hierarchy down even further when we're doing this modeling. And so here we have another iteration. Now, at some point, I don't expect you to be able to read the little words. Um, the big observation is look at the number of boxes and the number of lines connecting them. Uh, you know, each of those represents a class and a connection between those classes. Um, so here I have an interface to a game, I have a board game, I have a card game, I have a deck, a deck has cards. So, you, so really if you think about this from an object-oriented standpoint, you might think this is a good design because you know, for any game that has a deck, I could make a card that has a particular value, whether it's a, a standard uh, you know, face cards or cards specific to a game. Same kind of thing with uh, a board game. But, um, I might want to refine it some more because there are corner cases that we need to deal with when we're designing games. Um, and uh, for example, some board games have cards. Um, the game that I'm uh, modeling, Cartagena, uh, is a very simple board game and it does have a deck of cards, so it's a board game that has cards. And some card games have boards. Um, there are some games where you may have a, a deck and then every player has a mat or a board or something to kind of keep track of their points or their actions or, or some aspect of that game. So if you had that situation, well, how would you do that if I have a board game class and a card game class? Well, I could do a multiple inheritance if your language supports that, which uh, Java does not. Um, we all know that multiple inheritance is bad. That's what we're taught from day one. Uh, so uh, if we can't do that, then we do single inheritance with composition. So we pick the class that is most like what we're doing, and we extend that class, and then we implement all the interfaces that are appropriate. And, um, then we, uh, and then we go through the process of taking all the abstract versions of those classes and make an inner implementation and then proxy every single one of those methods. Um, and so that's just something for, you know, one way we might decompose it. And there are, are a lot of things we can uh, go to go further. Here's an example of another game. This game is called Twilight Imperium. It's a very uh, uh, detailed game if you wanted to model one of the most complicated board games out there. It is a uh, game that has uh, an evolving board. Each player has their own board. It has multiple decks. It has a lot of pieces. Um, and so if you were to make a, a, a class hierarchy, something that was abstract and general enough for everybody, it would be very complicated. So, but let's just look at what we did if we uh, took the previous class diagram and just had the ability to have uh, board games with cards or card games with boards. So it gets even more complicated. And so now I have a, um, a default card game with a board and a default board game with cards. I still haven't gotten to the point of having games that have multiple decks or anything else. Um, and, and so it doesn't, it's not particularly general. Um, and so if you, you could continue down this path and say, I'm gonna refine this some more, but at this point I'm just gonna say stop. You know, if, if this is something that you do a lot of and you've seen in your life, uh, you know, stop doing this. Um, you know, why are you doing this? Um, I don't know why, we, I don't know why we do it. I think it's when we're taught object-oriented programming, it is natural to look at the, the system, whatever system it is we're modeling and say, well, this particular thing makes sense and it's got this subcomponent, and so it's, and it's good to understand your relationships, but then we immediately try to turn that into objects and um, we end up with something that's very compl complex. And oftentimes, even very simple problems when we try to, particularly when we're trying to be general, 
when we try to make a class hierarchy for those can be very, very complicated. Um, and um, if you're familiar with the idea of, of complectedness, it's a term that I, I think comes mostly out of the closure community, but it's this idea of things being tied together like a knot. And uh, nearly everything when you do this is tied together because all of your systems and your subsystems and components are tied together. Every class knows about every other class that it might possibly touch. Um, and you know, furthermore, another problem with this, I, I've spent all this time trying to make these classes, but these really are only structural classes. They are, thing, they are the, uh, the is-as and the has a relationships. I haven't even got to the does a uh, situation of uh, methods. So I haven't even gotten to the point of going into my methods and saying, well, I have all these interfaces. What are the, you know, a player can, you know, a player can play, um, you know, a dice can roll, um, all these different things and how they interact with each other. Um, and even then, I can flesh out the, uh, the method definitions, but I don't have implementations yet. Um, and so top-down API design can be very time-consuming. Um, it can result in a lot of code, but it's something that I see um, you know, when, I, when I'm uh, on a more object-oriented related project. Um, it's something that I've seen a lot in my life where people, uh, I, I don't know exactly what the roots of this is. I think it's just because we, we, we try to think naturally in terms of objects. And we think if we break things down into all the relationships, somehow that, that makes life easier. Um, it happens all the time. Um, there is a better way. Uh, and just kind of for future reference, uh, here's a potential class diagram for the uh, Cartagena game that, I, uh, that I'm talking about. Um, just a few numbers, and this is just for comparison. Uh, you know, there's 22 classes, 11 interfaces, and enumeration. There's no implementations of anything at this point. They're just relationships. Um, and so far, just to do this, it's 270 lines of code. I don't have any getters or setters yet. Um, you know, it's, 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 you know, by the time I, I do all this, it's going to be uh, a, a fairly large code base for something that really is pretty simple. And um, some people might say, well, you're trying to make it overly complicated. Um, I think even when we try to do this as simply as we possibly can, oftentimes we lose the abstractions we're trying to build. Um, and we don't capture all the corner cases. And, even then, there is still a lot of things that need to be filled out, and we still have a lot of unnecessary uh, academic exercises in which we're just looking for relationships and trying to understand the, you know, the is as the has as the does as you know, and, the, and everything else. So let's talk about bottom-up design uh, or data-first design. And this, uh, like with top-down design, that tries to answer the question, what are all of my relationships, and do I fully understand all of my pieces? Instead. When, when I'm starting bottom up or particularly data first, the question I want to ask is how do I represent my domain as data? And then uh, also what functions do I need to manipulate that data? So it's all about looking at whatever problem I'm doing and saying how do I map that problem directly as data? And in Clojure, we're talking about uh, collection literals, values, something that I can sit down and, and, and code up using uh, you know, maps, lists, uh, vectors, primitives, and so on. And again, you know, similar, similarly, we have a, a flow diagram of how we might do this. Um, we have these two values, x and x prime. x is the starting value. Um, x prime is the finishing value, the thing I want to get to. And so it's, it's, it's a much simpler process. You look and you say, do I have the function that gets me from x to x prime? Um, if I don't have that function, then I develop that function. What's, what's neat about this is I have two pieces of data that I can work with in isolation. I can develop this function in isolation, and then once, I've done, once I'm done, I have this, this new piece that I can add to my, my API. Um, and so then I'm going to continue doing that for that piece of data to get, to get the different mappings that I need. Um, and then if I do have all these functions for that particular piece of data, I might want to take that data and combine it with other data. But again, I'm still, I'm still working with data. And then I have that data, and I say, all right, what are the functions I need to apply to that data to transform it? Um, and I repeat this process. And then once I'm finally done, I have a, a functional API. And so let's go back to the example I've been talking about. And I'm going to talk specifically about this uh, closure game. Um, and some of these methods might apply to, to any game. Um, or not closure game, Cartagena game. Um, the starting data that I have is simply a set of players. And the players are a player's name and their color. So it's, it's, it's that simple. And what I want is to represent my game state uh, throughout the game uh, in this particular uh, data structure here. So I need to know a few things. I need to know my turn order. Turn order is going to change with every game because there's going to be a different number of players, and players might choose a different color. So that's something that's relevant to the, uh, the current value of my game. Um, 
And in this, in this case, rather than having a, a turn sequence or a turn order generator class, I just have a simple map that says if it's this player's color, when their, player, when their turn ends, we go to this, this next player's color. And we key off their color, not their name, because you can have multiple people with the same name playing the game, but you only get one, one color. Um, we now have uh, our, our next section for how I represent my game as data is the uh, player section of this uh, structure. And the players have, um, they're keyed off of their color. They have a name, they have a certain number of cards. And again, rather than having a, a, a deck class and a hand class and everything else to do card management, I simply have a map of the card types and the number of cards that each player has. And then finally, uh, I have a certain number of actions that are assigned to each player. And again, rather than having an action object and having to deal with any sort of a, a complex definition, I just give them an integer number of actions. Uh, and then the last thing I need is a uh, data structure that represents my board. Again, simple data. It's just a, uh, a board uh, key value pair. And that board is simply a sequence of pieces on the board. So for each item, that represents a, a square as you move forward on the board. It keeps track of the number of each player piece of, of their color on that board, board square, as well as the symbol that's on that square. And the symbols start with start and then they go through the various different symbols that are on the board and they end with boat, that's the, that's the goal. So if I were to start with my initial piece of data, which is the player names and their colors, and then this final piece of data, which is the, the initial game state, how would I do that? Well, I'm gonna need some functions. Um, I need some generator functions to, to uh, deal out cards, to create a board sequence, that's turn sequence, and then I need some kind of an initialization function that puts all that together. And just, just, just to point out, um, you know, for those that are very technical, these aren't functions from the mathematical standpoint, the ones that generate random cards because they uh, do have random behavior. But it is the behavior that I want. Um, so these are what these functions look like. They're very simple. So for the uh, functions that generate my cards, my board, and my turn sequence, I simply, if you, if you look at the code sample on line one, I have my card types. I define those as a simple set um, of types. And this particular game, the card types are hat, flag, pistol, sword, bottle, and key. So those are the symbols that are on the cards as well as on the, uh, on the game track. Um, I have a draw function, which is just a simple function that uh, I say how many cards I want, and then it repeatedly n times randomly gives me a card symbol. Um, I have a board sequence function, which uh, starts, which basically takes a sequence that starts with start and ends with boat. And then uh, six times it goes through all of the uh, symbols of my card type, shuffles those, creates a sequence, and then flattens it. And then finally, um, I have a create turn sequence, which just takes the colors of each player and then cycles them against each other into a map. So it's that easy. Uh, the next thing I do now, now that I've defined these functions is I have some player initialization functions. And so this initializes the uh, player's part of my uh, game value. Um, and this is where we start to take our little functions and build them up into bigger and bigger functions. And that really is the, the bottom up piece of this. You start with data and functions, and this process is going to be building up more and more complicated functions. And the complexity is in terms of the things they do, not the actual, fun the functions themselves aren't generally complex. So I have these uh, methods that I've developed that put cards into a player's hand. I have a, uh, a definition of an empty hand. that's just a map of uh, card type to, to zero, um, to zero cards and then an initial hand that draws six cards and puts it into a player's hand. And then I put all those together into this init players function. So it takes that, that set of player information and it returns the uh, portion of my game value representation that describes all of my uh, player state. Okay, and then the last piece of uh, the function that I'm trying to generate, the larger function is actually initialization of my game board. And so, I already had a function that generates a sequence of symbols, but I'll, I need to map that into a sequence of board squares that have a symbol on it, as well as keeping track of the number of pirates that are on each of those spaces. And so I have a add initial pieces function and a make board function, and I combine all those together into the setup board function. I'm not expecting everybody to understand all the, the code here, and I don't have the entire uh, uh, listing for the code up here. Mainly, the again, the goal, and I'll, I'll repeat this, is to uh, build larger capability from functions. We're composing functions up from the bottom rather than starting with this high idea and decomposing it down to lots of little, uh, little pieces. <clears throat> 
So now I have this init game state function. It uses three functions I've already defined. Um, I have my example input, and if I were to feed that example input into init game state, I get this result, which is exactly what I showed you before. So um, I have data, I built up a bunch of very small functions um, out of small functions, and I now have a complete representation of my game at just before turn one uh, as data. So a few observations about this. We've gone from a description as data, so we're describing what, where we wanted, where, where, we, where we started from, and where we want to be as data, to a functioning, meaning not just a description of the solution, but an actual solution, functional API, that completely constructs our domain model. And when I say domain model, I mean a complete uh, a, a value, a, it may be a complex value with you know, nested data and everything else, but it fully represents my game at a particular state. And if you're not doing games, if you're doing whatever other system uh, you're doing, I've, I've done this several times on, on many projects, uh, it works very well to, uh, to say, how do I represent my data? And then once you have that representation to develop functions to, to build that up and to manipulate it. Um, another observation is functions compose very well where objects do not. So um, I go through and I say, what are the functions I need? I build these functions, they all tend to be quite small. I can assemble them together into larger functions and reuse them in different ways. Um, and where objects, you can, you can do inheritance, I guess, to whatever level you want, but really, um, I think that my experience has been when I see APIs that have deep inheritance hierarchies, uh, they tend to uh, be uh, very difficult to use. I don't think it, uh, in practice, turns out to be a very good thing. Objects really do not compose, um, and they don't really have a lot of reuse. Um, uh, small functions are composed of other small functions, so your, uh, your functionality increases, but your function size does not, so you get more functions. Um, but you don't get a lot of bigger functions. Um, and all this was done in about 40 lines of code. So my uh, straw man class diagram that I showed before, it was about 270 lines of code. Um, and all it did was describe relationships and structure. It didn't really do anything. Um, I'm already at the point where I can get, get uh, from player description to uh, you know, turn one in 40 lines. So I've already got something that works and it's, it's, it's much more concise. And I think it makes a lot more sense to do it this way. Um, how would I actually play my game? Well, um, there are uh, types of functions that I'm going to develop to do this. Uh, I need to know some functions about how I would do turn sequencing. So when a, when a turn ends, then whose turn is next? Uh, some queries that are just generally of use to know uh, just different pieces of information, like do I have a winner yet? Um, I need to determine what movements I can make. And then finally, I have these top level actions and I'll spend a, a whole slide talking about those. So turn sequencing has three functions only. Uh, first, I need to assign an active player, and because I represented the actions in my game as just an integer number, um, all I do is I go through and just set their actions to three. So it's that, it's that simple. Um, determine who the active player is. It's just the player that has uh, a positive number of actions, and then that player's color, uh, since it's a key value pair that gets returned, I just return the key from the previous function. So um, making use of these functions as I build them up. Um, Queries, these are just some useful functions that I, can, that, that I can ask about my system. Do I have a winner yet? Which means do I have six players of this, or six tokens of the same color on the very last square? Um, is a particular space occupied? Does a player have a particular card? These are the kind of things I want to know. Um, and again, I'm, I'm making use of functions that I've been developing. Determining movement. So now I'm building up to uh, the, the, the place in which I can say, can I move forward or backward? Um, to move forward, I need to know what's the next space with the card symbol or the boat on it. And to move backward, I want to know what's the last space behind the, the person that I want to move that only has one or two uh, pirates on it. So, um, and I'm making use of the functions that I developed uh, in the previous slide. So all these functions that I've been building, all these little functions, they, 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 the, the thing that they build up to are what I call top level functions. And a top level function is simply a function that, that represents your entire state of your system, or a piece of data that represents the entire state of your system, and can transform that into another appropriate full representation of your system. Um, so these types of functions are very valuable because if you're building uh, any sort of application where you're representing a system, you can apply these functions to them, and then you still get a new valid system. And so all you really have to do is keep track of the, the thing that is monitoring that. Uh, using like a closure atom, for example, and then you can apply these functions to them. So that really is the top level of your API. Um, 
So some things you can do with these top level functions is you can thread state. Um, and I prepared this talk to be kind of a, uh, have, have an audience of people who are new to Clojure or, or don't have a ton of experience. So um, I don't know how, how many of you are familiar with the threading macro. Probably most of you who have done a lot of Clojure are, but I know those who are dabbling may not. Um, so basically what you do is you take a value and you can build pipelines of capability. So I can take a, a value that represents my game and I could have these three functions, F, G, and H. And one of those functions might be, if it was a game, you know, uh, play a card. And then the next function might be uh, to fall back. And then the last function might be to pass. So I can compose uh, pipelines using these top level functions that take a game state and then, or, or a system state, and then, then thread that system state through these, through these functions. Um, I can iterate. Uh, iterate takes an initial value and then some function that I apply to it. And again, as long as I'm structurally similar, have, this, have the same shape, um, I can repeatedly apply this function to uh, a value and then get new values out and then again apply that to the same value and so on. Um, and I can do that until a, condition, a particular condition is met. Um, for this particular game that I'm doing, that's probably not something that I would do. But if you're doing, say, a physics simulation, whether that be uh, you know, you're doing actually a, you know, a science study or whether you're doing a, a game that iterates uh, over each time delta and then updates and does simulation uh, like a real-time strategy or first-person shooter type game, uh, you could use this iterate method to step forward in, in time to uh, compute several uh, states of your system. Uh, finally, where this is very useful is if you have some sort of an application that uh, keeps track of state, you can use a, a closure atom in there or you could use a, a ref or an agent, but in this case I'm using an atom. And that atom has a, uh, in this case, it's state. It keeps track of that value. I can swap that atom with my function. So I apply that top level function to the value, and then I get a new value um, that represents the, uh, the new state of my system. So these top level functions are particularly useful. And that really, when you're, when you're doing this bottom up design, that's kind of the, the thing that you're working for is to develop a, a series of these. Um, uh, so Cartagena, the top level functions, there's only three. Uh, they're pretty simple. They're, they're your game actions. You can play, you can pass, or you can fall back. Um, and this is what they look like. Um, again, I can you know, fit them all on one page. Uh, they're a little dense, but um, they, they all fit there. And the key point, though, is that they all make very heavy use of functions that I have already defined. So again, as I, as I define this API, I'm building more and more small functions that allow me to do a greater breadth of things. All right, so let me do a demo of what this game looks like. As I was going through some of the different applications I've developed in Clojure, this is the one that I thought was most appropriate for the topic, even though it's one of the first ones I, probably this may be the first non-like Hello World application that I did in, did in Clojure. And so this was when I was doing everything using uh, Java and AWT. So it's not a pretty demo, but it is a working demo. So I have this track, and I have these symbols for these two players. There's a yellow player and a green player. It's the yellow player's turn. I just color their cards by their color. And then I can uh, play their various pieces until so they move forward to the next thing that uh, uh, the, the next item, the symbol that I played, they move forward to the next uncovered square. Now it's green's turn. So at this point, I'm just going to play out all the uh, play out all their cards, get them all out on the board. Now normally what you would do is actually look at the cards in your hand and figure out which ones move you the furthest ahead. Because if somebody's just played a lot of bottles and all the bottles are covered up and if you play a bottle then you can move way ahead. Um, and so now everybody's out of cards and so you can pick it's yellow's turn so this guy's gonna uh, fall back and he got a skull and then this guy he's gonna fall back too and then he got a key, and then he can fall back again to get two cards. Now it's gonna to go to green's turn, so I don't see exactly what two cards he got. Um, and then uh, you can continue to do that. So this guy can fall back, this guy can fall back, and then as you earn cards, you can move forward again. And so uh, I won't bore you by playing a uh, game against myself until we get to the end, um, but that's what the game looks like, and so it's a, uh, so we have a fully functioning uh, application uh, with not very much code and not very much effort. So some observations about this. Uh, the entire application uh, really is just a bunch of collection, a collection of functions applied to data. And, and this really is kind of the, 
one of the major outcomes of, or, or ideas of this presentation is when you're doing functional programming, especially closure functional programming, it's functions applied to data. Um, you build a lot of small functions that you compose from other small functions. So in this case, I went through and counted, I have 31 functions. The longest one is only seven lines. So they're all very small, single use, but they can easily be recombined. Um, top level functions uh, thread the full, the full state of my application. So they, they, can, they allow me to, rep they, they take a full representation of my domain and they manipulate it to some new full representation given some delta, whether that's playing a card or, or over time or whatever the, uh, whatever is relevant in your, in your application that you're making changes to. And the total rule base for this is only 144 lines of code. So it's pretty, it's pretty small. And uh, again, this is uh, about half the size of the amount of uh, just skeleton code that I wrote just to make a class diagram uh, the other way. So um, you can jump right into your problem and start solving the problem right away. Um, as far as the user interface, um, I'm not gonna show the code for that. Uh, just a couple observations about it. Uh, there was one atom used, so there's only one stateful variable, if you want to call it that, one thing that is keeping track of my state in the entire application. And the, uh, that particular part of the, the UI is a couple hundred lines of code, so it's pretty small. But the UI was very simple, and I found this to be true with any sort of user interface. And this is whether you're doing, uh, I've, you know, I've done UIs in ClojureScript as well as in Clojure, um, and whatever framework you're using, it turns out to be very simple because all you really have to do is render the current value. You've got this value in data that represents the current state of the system, and so you just need to render that, whether that's rendering it using dialogues or rendering it using some 2D or 3D graphics engine. All you have to do is draw a picture of it, um, you know, whatever, whatever that representation is, and then you have to have some way in which you execute actions against those values. So in this case, you know, it's your standard action listeners, and if you look at the code, the action listeners are literally you know, uh, you know, action performed, swap state, and then pass, or play card or fall back with the argument attached to it. So the actual interplay between the API that I, de that I developed and the user interface is extremely minimal, and they're highly decoupled, which is very nice. The fact that they're decoupled means that the rule piece of this will compile directly as closure script as well. Um, and there are a few little caveats with closure script and closure, but for this particular one, I don't think there were any requirements to, uh, to do any sort of a conditional uh, uh, modification uh, the uh, reader conditionals. Um, and so it compiles directly either way. And so the cool thing about that then is you could easily develop a different interface for this. If you wanted to do a, you know, a really cool, uh, you know, better implementation of my interface, which would be almost any implementation of an interface, um, you could do a, uh, like a 3D Im implementation using the JMonkey engine. Again, that would, that would be pure Java. Uh, you could do Quill. Uh, if you haven't done Quill yet, Quill is this awesome API that allows you to um, compile as ClojureScript and have a Java target, or you can compile it down to JavaScript and run it in a web page, um, or you could uh, compile it so it runs as just a straight HTML in, in a canvas, uh, doing it that way. Um, so why is Clojure especially suited to this? When you, when you go Google up uh, top down and bottom up and people talk about this, oftentimes the criticism of bottom up is, you just kind of start somewhere and, and then you, like I need this other thing and I build that and then it's tied together and there's no real design. Well, Clojure is uniquely suited to this because that, that initial coupling that happens when people, when people have their criticisms of it does not occur because data is the thing that you're modeling. You're not modeling classes that are just complected from, from step zero. Um, and other functional languages, even, and, and so really it's, 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 closure, it's closure as data that enables this, not because closure is functional. So I spent a lot of time doing Scala. Scala is a great language, I really like Scala. However, Scala still uses classes. And even if you're doing you know, very functional Scala and you're doing case classes, everything is immutable and you've got a lot of functions, you still have all of your functions in your classes and so objects are still the glue that pulls all that together. And so even then people I think often naturally uh, uh, drift towards this, let's, let's decompose everything into classes versus let's just start with data and apply functions to it. Clojure is the only JVM language I'm aware of and, and um, you know, the only language I'm aware of that separates uh, the, value, the concerns of value function and state. So all those things, you, you, they, they really aren't tied together using objects as the glue. Um, so in summary, uh, top-down design, it seeks to decompose a problem into its, into its uh, constituent parts. And I will say this, uh, top-down design actually is a very important idea and an important concept, and you should do it um, it's good to understand the high-level relationships, your modules, your, your subcomponents, your functionality. However, and here's the, here's the, here's the, the, big, the big catch, 
when you take those things that you figured out and then you immediately say, I'm gonna turn all these into objects, that is the, that's when you're stepping on the landmine because then um, you are automatically saying, I'm turning everything into objects and I'm complexing everything, everything is connected. Instead, use that, that information that you found to figure out what does my data look like and what functions do I need to apply to that data to transform it. If you spend a lot of time uh, trying to figure out what are, what, you know, what's the be all end all class hierarchy for something, you can spend a lot of time uh, away from your goal of solving some problem. Instead, you're just making APIs. Uh, bottom up design, uh, you start with data. Uh, and, and the developer actually understands the problem better because rather than saying, well, let's sit, sit around and talk about the is-us and the has-us, it's let's make a, a data structure and start filling in the values and see what it looks like. And you'll very quickly find things that don't work and the things that do work. Um, and again, your functions focus on data transformation. Um, it may not sound really exciting, but it actually gets you there pretty quickly, so it's, a, it's pretty cool. Uh, and then the API is the function, so it's just a collection of functions that you generate when you're done. Uh, functions are inherently reusable and composable in a way that objects aren't, um, and it allows the developer to focus on specifically the, the specific problem at hand, because there's one, one particular, wherever you are in the system, there's one piece of data that you're focusing on at that time to get to another piece of data, and you can focus on that without having to worry about state and mutability and anything else. Final thoughts. Um, I've done a lot of object-oriented programming. Um, I've been doing uh, functional programming for the past couple of years, so I've seen the, you know, the, good, the good and the bad. Um, and uh, I find that data-first design is very refreshing. When you start from the bottom and say, how do I accurately represent my system, and then how do I start applying functions to that? Um, it gets me where I want to be a lot quicker. I do a lot less work in terms of code and time and I end up with a solution that is much simpler and easy to understand. And so um, if this is not something that's familiar to you, or even if it is, uh, give it a try on your next project. Um, I think that, uh, at least for me, it, it, uh, I, I think it's a, a, great, a great approach. Uh, any questions?